Welcome to Fortune Forecast, and I am Daisy Raisler, your hostess. We are now walking through the final chapters of Thought Vibration, or The Law of Attraction in the Thought World, by William Walker Atkinson. This book was published by the New Thought Publishing Company in 1906. It is in the public domain. My takeaway from the last chapter was two of them. One, he was talking about how many people, so many people waste too much energy and, and they do so much and then there's nothing to show for it. And then the other thing was when he was saying that there are too many people that undervalue themselves and then overvalue others. And I will admit to you, I definitely, that's probably still one of the things that I just recently started to overcome, thinking that maybe other people, for some unknown reason, are better than me. And I just needed to stop that. (laughs) I just needed to stop that and just really focus on being the best version of myself and to strive to be better. Eh, I don't know if that makes sense. But anyway, enough of that. Let's go on. Pretty good stuff coming ahead. Claiming your own. In a recent conversation, I was telling a woman to pluck up courage and to reach out for a certain good thing for which she had been longing for many years and which at last appeared to be in sight. I told her that it looked as if her desire was about to be gratified, that the law of attraction was bringing it to her. She lacked faith and kept on repeating, Oh, it's too good to be true. It's too good for me. She had not emerged from the worm of the dust stage, and although she was in sight of the promised land, she refused to enter it because it was too good for her. I think I succeeded in putting sufficient ginger into her to enable her to claim her own, for the last reports indicate that she is taking possession. But that is not what I wish to tell you. I want to call your attention to the fact that nothing is too good for you. No matter how great the thing may be, no matter how undeserving you may seem to be, you are entitled to the best there is. For it is your direct inheritance. So don't be afraid to ask, demand, and take. The good things of the world are not the portion of any favored sons. They belong to all, but they come only to those who are wise enough to recognize that the good things are theirs by right, and who are sufficiently courageous to reach out for them. Many good things are lost for want of the asking. Many splendid things are lost to you because of your feeling that you are unworthy of them. Many great things are lost to you because you lack the confidence and courage to demand and take possession of them. None but the brave deserves the fair, says the old adage. And the rule is true in all lines of human effort. If you keep on repeating that you are unworthy of the good thing, that it is too good for you, the law will be apt to take you at your word and believe in what you say. That's a peculiar thing about the law. It gives what you say. It takes you in earnest. So beware what you say to it, for it will be apt to give you credence. Say to it that you are worthy of the best there is, and that there is nothing too good for you, and you will be likely to have the law take you in earnest, and say, I guess he is right. I'm going to give him the whole big shop if he wants it. He knows his rights, and what's the use of trying to deny it to him? But if you say, oh, it's too good for me, the law will probably say, well, I wouldn't wonder about what that is so. Surely he ought to know, and if it isn't for me to contradict him, and so it goes. Why should anything be too good for you? Did you ever stop to think just what you are? You are a manifestation of the whole thing and have a perfect right to all there is. Or, if you prefer it this way, you are a child of the infinite 
and are heir to it all. You are telling the truth in either statement or both. At any rate, no matter for what you ask, you are merely demanding your own. And the more in earnest you are about demanding it, the more confident you are of receiving it. The more will you use in reaching out for it, the surer you will be to obtain it. Strong desire, confident expectation, courage in action, these things bring to you your own. But before you put these forces into effect, you must awaken to a realization that you are merely asking for your own and not for something to which you have no right or claim. So long as there exists in your mind the last sneaking bit of doubt as to your right to the things you want, you will be setting up a resistance to the operation of the law. You may demand as vigorously as you please, but you will lack the courage to act if you have a lingering doubt of your right to the thing you want. If you persist in regarding the desired thing as if it belonged to another instead of to yourself, you will be placing yourself in the position of the covetous or envious man, or even in the position of a tempted thief. In such a case, your mind will revolt at proceeding with the work, for it instinctively will recoil from the idea of taking what is not your own. The mind is honest, but when you realize that the best of the universe holds, belongs to you as a divine heir, and that there is enough for all without your robbing anyone else, then the friction is removed and the barrier broken down and the law proceeds to do its work. I do not believe in this humble business. This meek and lowly attitude does not appeal to me. There's no sense in it at all. The idea of making a virtue of such things when man is the heir of the universe and is entitled to whatever he needs for his growth, happiness, and satisfaction? I do not mean that one should assume a blustering and domineering attitude of mind. That is also absurd. For true strength does not so exhibit itself. The blusterer is a self-confessed weakling. He blusters to disguise his weakness. The truly strong man is calm, self-contained, and carries with him a consciousness of strength which renders unnecessary the bluster and fuss of assumed strength. But get away from this hypnotism of humility, this meek and lowly attitude of mind. Remember the horrible example of Uriah Heep, and beware of imitating him. Throw back your head and look the world square in the face. There's nothing to be afraid of. The world is apt to be as much afraid of you as you are of it anyway. Be a man or woman and not a crawling thing. And this applies to your mental attitude as well as to your outward demeanor. Stop this crawling in your mind. See yourself as standing erect and facing life without fear and you will gradually grow into your ideal. There is nothing that is too good for you. Not a thing. The best there is is not beginning to be good enough for you. For there are still better things ahead. The best gift that the world has to offer is a mere bauble compared to the great things in the cosmos that await your coming of age. So don't be afraid to reach out for these playthings of life, these baubles of this plane of consciousness. Reach out for them. Grab a whole fistful. Play with them until you are tired. That's what they're made for, anyway. They are made for our express use. Not to look at, but to be played with if you desire. Help yourself. There's a whole shopful of these toys awaiting your desire, demand, and taking. Don't be bashful. Don't let me hear any more of this silly talk about things being too good for you. You have been like the emperor's little son, thinking that tin soldiers and toy drum were far too good for him and refusing to reach out for them. 
but you don't find this trouble with children as a rule. They instinctively recognize that nothing is too good for them. They want all that is in sight to play with, and they seem to feel that the things are theirs by right. And that is the condition of mind that we seekers after the divine adventure must cultivate. Unless we become as little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The things we see around us are the playthings of the kindergarten of God, playthings which we use in our game tasks. Help yourself to them. Ask for them without bashfulness. Demand as many as you can make use of. They are yours. And if you don't see just what you want, ask for it. There's a big reserve stock on the shelves and in the closets. Play, play, play to your heart's content. Learn to weave mats, to build houses with the blocks, to stitch out lines on the squares. Play the game through and play it well. And demand all the proper materials for the play. Don't be bashful. There's enough to go around. But remember this, while all this be true, the best things are still only game things. Toys, blocks, mats, cubes, and all the rest. Most pleasant with which to play, most desirable for these purposes. Get all the fun and profit out of the use of things that is possible. Throw yourself heartily into the game and play it out. It is good. But here's the thing to remember. Never lose sight of the fact that these good things are but playthings, part of the game. And you must be perfectly willing to lay them aside when the time comes to pass into the next class and not cry and mourn because you must leave your playthings behind you. Do not allow yourself to become unduly attached to them. They are for your use and pleasure, but are not part of you, not essential to your happiness in the next stage. Despise them not because of their lack of reality. They are great things relatively, and you may as well have all the fun out of them that you can. Don't be a spiritual prig, standing aside and refusing to join in the game. But do not tie yourself to them. They are good to use and play with, but not good enough to use you and to make you a plaything. Don't let the toys turn the tables on you. This is the difference between the master of circumstances and the slave of circumstances. The slave thinks that these playthings are real and that he is not good enough to have them. He gets only a few toys because he is afraid to ask for more and he misses most of the fun. And then, considering the toys to be real and not realizing that there are plenty more where these came from, he attaches himself to the little trinkets that have come his way and allows himself to be made a slave of them. He is afraid that they may be taken away from him, and he is afraid to toddle across the floor and help himself to the others. The master knows that all are his for the asking. He demands that which he needs from day to day and does not worry about overloading himself, for he knows that there are lots more and that he cannot be cheated out of them. He plays and plays well and has a good time in the play, and he learns his kindergarten lessons in the playing. But he does not become too much attached to his toys. He is willing to fling away the worn-out one and reach out for a new one, and when he is called on to the next room for promotion, he drops on the floor the worn-out toys of the day, and with glistening eyes and confident attitude of mind, marches into the next room into the great unknown with a smile on his face. He is not afraid, for he fears the voice of the teacher and knows that she is there waiting for him in that great next room. And that concludes chapter 15. 
Let's stride on to chapter 16.